So today is the 3rd of July, 2021. We're coming close to the holiday of Asalaha Puja, which is the day we commemorate the first teaching of the Lord Buddha. And we recollect that the Buddha awakened to the Dhamma on the 15th lunar day of the 6th lunar month, which has uh, passed already. And this happened back in the time of the Buddha many years ago. And after the Buddha awakened, he entered the bliss of liberation at seven different places for seven days each, for a total of 49 days of enjoying the bliss of liberation. And after this 49-day period, the Buddha walked to go teach the group of five ascetics, the Panchawagya, at the Deer Park at Isipatana at Varanasi. This was approximately a 230-kilometer walk. So the Buddha walked there because he saw that this group of five ascetics, composed of Venerable Anya Kondanya, Venerable Wapa, Venerable Mahanama, Venerable Badiya, and Venerable Asaji, they uh, were renunciates. They practiced the renunciate life. And the Buddha used his uh, special knowledge to know beforehand who he should go teach, who would be receptive to the Dhamma. So using this special knowledge, the Buddha contemplated and saw that his two former teachers who taught him about samadhi, about deep concentration before his awakening, Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta, these two ascetic teachers, that it was a great shame that they had already passed away because these two teachers of the Buddha when he was a bodhisattva taught about entering into deep states of absorption into jhanas. And so after death, they entered to the Brahma realms and they entered into high level Brahma realms where they don't receive any external information or external sense contact. They just uh, are absorbed in the bliss of their samadhi because their minds are deep in the, the happiness and bliss of their unification of mind. So this is very much a shame, quite unfortunate, that they can't listen to the Dhamma of the Buddha because if they were able to listen to the Dhamma in no long time, they'd realize full awakening, arahantship, without much difficulty. So the Buddha walked to go teach the group of five ascetics because he saw that they had sufficient wisdom to understand the Dhamma. So the Buddha went to go teach them. And this was based on the great compassion of the Lord Buddha, which is uh, vast and great, uh, without limit, without compare. And we see that before his awakening, the Lord Buddha built Parami to a vast and great degree built parami for 20 incalculable periods and 100,000 eons. And after his awakening, the Buddha was happy and at ease in his own heart already. But because of his loving kindness and compassion springing out of the purity of his mind, he went to go teach those who could understand. He went to walk, traveled far to teach the group of five ascetics. And even the five ascetics themselves were walking. So the Buddha went to follow them. And we can see in this day what religious founder, what teacher in the world would uh, would go to these lengths, would do this, to go teach, to bring something of great value to disciples. So the Buddha reached the group of five ascetics and Anya Kondanya, Venerable Anya Kondanya, thought to himself, well, the Buddha came and walked such a long distance like this, walked so far to teach us. He had the wisdom to see this. But the other four in the group still didn't have belief or faith arise in their heart like this. They didn't take the Buddha's words to heart. But Anya Kondanya did take the Buddha's words to heart. So he listened to this first teaching, and he was the first one to see the Dhamma. 
And before the Buddha gave his teaching, he said to them, Listen, look here, have, have I ever spoken these words to you? Have you ever heard these words before? That the Tathagata has succeeded already. The holy uh, self-awakened Buddha, the one who knows, the Arahant, has come into this world. Have you ever heard these words before? So hearing just this, then Anya Kandanya was intent to listen. And then the Buddha gave the first discourse. And the Buddha taught that whatever is of the nature to arise is of the nature to pass away. That this is the nature of reality. This is how things are. This is normal. And we can ask ourselves, why did Anya Kandanya not know this already? Because we see that having been born, we all experience old age, we experience sickness, and we experience death. And this is normal and natural. Whether it's a living being or a non-living object, all phenomena are of the nature to degrade, to pass away. And this is normal. This is the way things are. So Anya Kandanya, just like ourselves, would have seen this a lot. He would have seen this uh, over and over again. So we can ask, well, what was he seeking then? Well, he was seeking the Dhamma. He was seeking that which doesn't die. We can see that this is how it is. We don't see the Dhamma because something is stopping our vision. Something's covering over our hearts. And this is delusion that covers over the heart that makes it so that one is not able to see the truth of reality that's all around us. We see that the sawakas, the awakened disciples, they can't see this truth by themselves because their parami, their spiritual virtues, are insufficient because of uh, awija, ignorance, thirst, and attachment are covering over the heart very thickly. So because of this, then... There is no way out. There's no way that one can see the way out. It's only the fully self-awakened Buddha, the one who knows, the one who knows clearly and thoroughly. It's only the Buddha that awakens to it on his own and then has the capacity and has the skill to teach others to know in his footsteps, to know after the fully self-awakened Buddha. And we see that one of the qualities of a Buddha is that the Buddha is the unsurpassed teacher of heavenly beings and humans. And the Buddha teaches the nature of the way things are. So Venerable Anya Kandanya was able to take this teaching, to contemplate it, and then to see clearly. He saw the Dhamma. So considering this, we see that we ourselves have not yet seen clearly. And we can ask, why is this? Well, it's because the mindfulness and samadhi are not yet complete. The virtue, our sila, is not yet complete. And even when we do have complete and full sila and virtue, then the mind is still not yet peaceful, still not yet unified in samadhi. So therefore, we must practice samadhi every single day. We have to practice this. Because a human being is a type of being that's trainable. And the human has the potential to train to be the highest of all. For example, the fully self-awakened Buddha is born as a normal human, but is a human with the highest degree of spiritual virtue, with the very highest level of parami, uh, these parami of which there are ten types. In the course of building these parami, the bodhisattva even sacrifices the bodhisattva's life many times over to build parami to the utmost. And the bodhisattva does this a lot until they're able to realize complete Buddhahood, where they know the truth for themselves. So it is uh, possible for the mind of a human to be able to know and see clearly like this. And it's possible if we build our spiritual virtues. So if we continue to build our parami, then it's possible to raise up our hearts to a level 
that's very sublime and blissful, like that of a deva, a heavenly being. And a deva is one with shame, moral shame and moral conscience that shies away from doing evil and fears the results of evil. This is what we call the wealth of a heavenly being, these qualities of Hiri and Otapa. So we can also build our samadhi, our collectedness of mind, until it's very firm, until we have a lot of samadhi. And then one has the mind at the level of a Brahma deity. One has uh, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And this is the mind of a Brahma with metta, garuna, mudita, and upeka. And these Brahma deities are exist in many different levels. They're higher or lower, lower according to the level of their minds, according to the energy of their minds, the energy of the peace of samadhi. And so this peace of samadhi can bring the mind to the highest levels of the Brahma worlds, but it's still a mind that has not yet attained to Dhamma, not yet seen the Dhamma. This is because there's still a sense of self there, still a sense of me and mine. And it is a sense of self that's good, that has goodness, a sense of self that doesn't want agitation and chaos, that doesn't want to be involved with outer things, a sense of self that just wants the peace of samadhi, but it's still a sense of self. However, the Buddha taught that this is still within the realm of samsara, within the realm of birth and death. There's still birth and death there. Because this energy of samadhi, for instance, jhana, these deep absorptions, causes one to be born into these sublime realms. But then one is born again, and one has a sense of self again, just as before. Similarly, with the various deva realms, the devas are beings with merit and goodness, but they have a sense of self again. And then they're born and die, born and die in this uh, cycle of samsara. So the Buddha taught the way, taught clearly about this, taught to cut off the sense of self, to cut off the sense of me and mine. And initially, the Buddha taught to start with generosity, with dana. Because if one has a lot of wealth, then one clings to all this wealth as mine, as me. And some people cling to this wealth up until their death. And they don't use their wealth to do anything of value. They don't use it in any way that's useful. Some individuals with wisdom... They know how to be generous, know how to sacrifice their wealth. And in the Buddha's dispensation, there are many like this who help the poor, help the disadvantaged. For instance, in the present time, many individuals are experiencing a lot of suffering, a lot of torment related to the uh, pandemic. Some don't have enough food or don't have medicine to care for their health. So we see that some uh, people help and sacrifice to help others in need and help in all ways with all things. So this is a being that has faith and has wisdom as well to do value in the Buddhist dispensation, to build up value and goodness in the Buddhist dispensation. This is something that exists in the hearts of beings. And it helps to cut off selfishness, to cut off me and mine. To bring the mind to peace and ease. To bring the mind to not wish harm on anyone. And this is a mind that doesn't wish harm to anyone and doesn't wish for the possessions of others either. And yet we must remember to keep enough to take care of our own lives so our own lives may go forward. And at this point, we strive to practice virtue, to practice sila. Because the Buddha taught about generosity and the benefits of generosity. And the Buddha taught virtue to restrain one's behavior of body and speech such that one's behavior doesn't harm oneself or harm others. And this is a cause for peace to arise in the world, for more peacefulness to arise. 
And in this way, beings have kindness and loving kindness for each other. And one sees that there's no need to build a lot of weapons like many countries in the world at present have done. But one sees that what's actually important to build is this quality of virtue. And if a country is able to do this, is able to build virtue, then there's no need to hurt or harm anyone else. But some people, this is something they can't bring themselves to do. So therefore we have agitation and chaos all over the world. So if we have the quality of virtue, we have generosity, the benefits of these are happiness and peace that arise in our minds. We see individuals that have generosity and virtue, their faces are fresh and bright and radiant, and they have happiness in their hearts. Then we listen to Dhamma, we practice concentration, we practice meditation, then we can feel fullness in our hearts, uh, happiness, and this is the arising of goodness, the arising of skillfulness and merit. Even just a little bit of this, and we can feel this fullness and contentedness in our hearts. This is the quality of having generosity, virtue, and meditation. And yet still our hearts may be filled with uh, agitation. Our hearts may still be disturbed. This is because of thinking, because of worry, because of fear, anger, hate, uh, love, and attraction. These all cause chaos to arise in the heart. Even if one has a lot of wealth, one may feel this way. And also people that don't have wealth, maybe in poverty, feel agitated uh, just the same because they want to be someone who has wealth. And they don't see that wealthy individuals have suffering as well. People that have wealth have suffering, but those without wealth may not yet understand this. They may, may not understand how someone with a lot of wealth gets suffering because they don't yet have it, and they want to have this wealth. And once they get this wealth, then they uh, suffer again. And the Buddha taught if one really wants to have wealth, then one must be one who is really sets their heart on it. You must have wisdom as well, must have sacrifice, must have effort. We must seek out knowledge with uh, mindfulness and wisdom and know how to seek wealth in a way that's correct and right. And when one is ready and one has uh, this wealth, then one contemplates and sees that one's heart is still agitated and disturbed because having a lot just means that one worries a lot. One has a lot of fear and all the wealth that one has gathered, one knows that one must separate from it eventually. One must separate from all the things that one has. So having love, then there's also fear. So therefore we come to practice Dhamma, to bring our minds to peace, to do this until our minds are stable and well-established in peace. And the way to this peace is Samadhi Bhavana, the practice of meditation, of bringing the mind to peace and stillness. So we train ourselves to do this. We practice, we have effort, and don't give up, keep doing it. Do it evenly and consistently. It's just like taking two sticks to rub together in order to get fire. We try to get fire, so we rub the sticks together without stopping. And if we stop rubbing the sticks together, then coolness arises. The heat is not continuous. Now wisdom doesn't arise. So we take the two sticks, rub them together, then put them down again. And do this back and forth, and fire never arises like this. But if we rub the sticks together without ceasing, then fire can arise. And we can consider that fire is in the wood already. It's in the two sticks already. So if we just keep bringing them together without stopping, then fire arises. These minds of ours have Buddha in them already, but if we don't seek out this Buddha, then it won't arise. So we must seek it out. We have to practice meditation. We have to study and know about arising and ceasing. 
to see clearly that all things arise, stay for a little while, and pass away. This is the arising of wisdom. We see that the practice of shamatha, tranquility, this is the way for wisdom to arise. And for the case of Venerable Anyakondanya, he was one with a samadhi that was full in his mind already. And he had actually known the Buddha for a very long time already. And he had practiced meditation since he was a young Brahmin. Because he knew the Buddha when he was still a bodhisattva, when he was the young prince Siddhartha, after he was just born. And after the birth of the bodhisattva, Venerable Anukandanya practiced severe asceticisms for 35 years. And so Anyakandanya had already practiced this severities, this asceticism for 35 years already. So in his mind, he already had deep samadhi, this deep peace and collectedness of mind. So when the Buddha came to teach him, he only had to make a little bit of effort to contemplate impermanence, stress, and not self to give rise to wisdom. And at this point, he was able to know clearly to see clearly into the Dhamma. And we can ask, well, when he listened to the Dhamma in the second discourse, how was it? When the Buddha taught the second discourse, the Anattalakana Sutta, the discourse on the quality of not-self, then Venerable Anyakandanya realized full awakening, our hunship. Because he was ready, he had this samadhi, this collectedness in his mind already, which is the cause, the foundation for wisdom to arise. So may we all have effort to practice samadhi together, to practice generosity, virtue, and samadhi, collectedness, to see clearly into the Dhamma, following in the footsteps of Venerable Anyakandanya, to see clearly the Dhamma in this very life. So may you all grow in blessings.